Um, and then, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit windy over here. Um, we were kind of, I think, <laughs> and actually, I really didn't know that. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. Actually, it's getting really, really strong. The glasses are out or on. It's history time. A brief history of screaming into tubes. The phonograph's origin story is messier than my soldering, as you'll soon see. Most people credit Thomas Edison in 1877, but as with many of Edison's inventions, he wasn't necessarily the first one with the original idea. The real MVP, whose name I'm going to butcher now because I don't speak French, was a French guy called Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville. And now let Google Translate say it again, so we actually know what he's called. Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville. Already in 1857, he built and patented the phono autograph, a device that could record sound but couldn't play it back. It also looked like a huge buck for some reason. He called the idea that led to this the imprudent idea of photographing the word and built his device to copy the function of the human ear. But back then, no one had considered, not even Scott de Martinville himself, that his phono autograms, meaning the scratched patterns that he recorded with his machine, might have enough detail to allow for the sound to be played back again. Which in turn means that Edison's breakthrough was adding playback to it. His first recording was a nursery rhyme. Just a man whispering into a tube, Mary had a little lamb, and then playing it back again. Like a Victorian ASMR artist. So, now that we know a little bit about the history, let's get to actually building it. Welcome to the building section of the video, where I actually walked into a hardware store like a real 40-year-old man looking to DIY his home. I think my build might be slightly unconventional, but as always, don't do as I do, and don't do as I say. because soldering a nut screw on metal wasn't my finest moment. I also used a monster energy can as my main rotational device upon which the aluminum foil later goes and made the handle by forcefully bending a pipe and hot gluing everything together in the end because I'm hot and glue holds everything together. Um, wait, what? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, at the very least, I can say two true things about this project. It was made by me and it was made with a lot of trash. So that's the bare minimum and we roll with that. Hello and welcome to the ultimate test of... Ooh. Oh, uh, my phonograph! <laughs> Here we have some kitchen oil. So I'm going to prepare this now and then we're going to start trying to record. Okay, and then we can start to record. So <laughs> I'm placing my needle just so that it scratches. And I'm streaming into this. This is like the voice making thing. Look, even if you, if you hear this, of course, my voice is going through here, then vibrating here in the diaphragm. And then it should transfer to the aluminum foil. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high. taken way too long and way too much of my sanity <laughs> but I don't know if it's because my sanity is dwindling or because it's working but I'm hearing it now I think it's playing it back to me and it's very scratchy and the audio quality is even worse than when I DIY'd my speaker I've got my microphone right here I'm gonna do another recording and you're gonna see what exactly I'm hearing as well do you like tomatoes I love tomatoes Wait, I'm gonna try another one. I like cucumbers too. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It might not be as elegant as what Edison did back in 18 something, but it is a trial. And honestly, for this all being trash, we proved science once again. Welcome to the sciencey part of how it all works. Today we're not in front of a whiteboard, but I created this beautiful Photoshop spread for you to explain it very simply because the phonograph actually works stupidly simple. So let's imagine we've got a person talking into the phonograph, which here we've got this beautiful illustration of Edison. And this person, when talking into the phonograph, the voice is kind of like a mechanical force. So if you talk, you make the air 
in front of your mouth vibrate and this vibration gets caught at the diaphragm which is situated here if we look at the sketch of the phonograph so you speak in here and your voice hits the diaphragm and the diaphragm begins to vibrate and because the diaphragm is like a small needle there as well the small needle also begins to vibrate and carve out this movement this vibration into our surface which for us would be aluminium foil but for Edison's um, original phonograph it was actually like wax cylinders which is also very smart because wax you can manipulate to be as hard as soft as you want it to be so it was very easy to carve into and also rewind again but yeah our needle here vibrates and we're going to need a new layer so because this here vibrates we kind of get like these shape forms engraved into our surface and if you play this back then again the diaphragm vibrates in the same way backwards which means it's giving back the voice or the mechanical energy that it received so that is why you hear the sound back if you play it backwards and this is also why a lot of the gramophones or early phonographs had these stupidly large horns it was simply for volume purposes because the biggest problem was making it loud enough again when it vibrates and gets back out so if you have like a cone shaped thing that naturally acts like as an amplifier or naturally acts to make the sound loud and yes, the same technique of scratching into a surface to record something and then playing it back again is also used in record players, if you think like vinyl plates or also CDs even. So this basic idea was used for a very, very long time in sound recording until we entered the digital age. For which you can also watch my videos on the microphone and the speaker if you want to learn more about that. Ready? Edison, either practical and visionary, or should I say corrupted by capitalism salesman, offered the following possible uses for his phonograph in North American Review in June of 1878. 1. Letter writing in all kinds of dictation. 2. Phonographic books, which will speak to blind people without effort on their part. 3. Teaching of elocution, or I guess in a more modern word, pronunciation. 4. Reproduction of music. 5. Family record, a registry of sayings, reminiscences, etc. by family members in their own voices, and the last words of dying persons. 6. Music boxes and toys. 7. Clocks that should announce in articulate speech the time for going home, going to meals, etc. 8. The preservation of languages by the exact reproduction of the manner of their pronunciation. 9. Educational purposes, such as preserving the explanations made by a teacher so that a pupil can refer to them at any moment. 10. Connection with the telephone, so as to make that instrument an auxiliary in the transmission of permanent and invaluable records, instead of being the recipient of momentary and fleeting communication. Which I guess is a very long and roundabout way of saying he wanted to have voice memos. <laughs> I think it's very interesting how all these users he described nearly 200 years ago are now things we don't even think about in modern life because they are so interesting connected like we have such an easy access to them that we don't even question it but back then it was revolutionary it was a thought into the future it was a what could be and now we are in the what is like just the idea of listening to music or having a movie which doesn't need a live orchestra to play with it because it has a soundtrack ingrained in it you know like video like the thing you're watching right now like youtube so next time you'd play on something you can think about that it all started with a needle some wax and a man who whispered a nursery rhyme into a cone and isn't that revolutionary in itself? As always, at this point in time, I just have to say thank you so much for sticking around and watching this video until the very end. Um, I'm really, truly grateful for everybody who's here and this channel is still just a place where I can explore my curiosities. So no, I don't know what video will come next, but I'm sure something will come around that will pique my curiosity because I tend to hyperfixate on many very different things. So if you want to stick around for that, you can hit the subscribe button and uh, see whatever I get up to next. But at this point in time, I just want to say, have a nice day, have a nice night, wherever you are. And as always, Buy me back on my channel. Hello, hello, hello. Mary had a little lamb.